Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another Manson Saga discussion panel interview. I'm Paul. That's Danny After Dark. Like and subscribe. And today we are absolutely stoked to have our friend Thomas Warming here. And Thomas has spent a ton of time with the elusive and the mysterious Mark Ross or Aesop Aquarian. And so if you don't know who he is, stick around because we're going to find out. And without further ado, here is our friend Thomas. Thank you so much for joining Hi. us, Thomas. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah, this is amazing because he is one of the uh, one of the more elusive characters in the story. As I was looking mm -hmm. into it, there's some people that just are like in your face. Yeah. And he's got like he's got a pivotal role in in a really big moment in it, but is but his name like until really really looking at it, I didn't put his name together with that. And that's the the I guess the suicide of zero <laughs> and the alleged. suicide alleged. Um but I think this is going to be really nice because from from you and from the article that that you helped with that we'll we'll get to talking about, um, you find out that this guy's just an amazing man all on his own mm -hmm. and just so interesting and has his has known so many interesting people and stuff. Yeah. So I think the best way to start is how okay, so you you weren't actually a part of the whole like Manson thing at all. That wasn't in your wheelhouse. You were what were you doing and how did you end up with Aesop and being so close? Well, it, it's kind of a long convoluted story because I um I grew up in Denmark in Copenhagen. Right. Lived most of my life until I was 40. And I got um uh sidetracked, but I got uh, an opportunity to work for a 3D animation company as a lead concept designer. So I was sponsored for a visa to go to New York and work on this film. And I basically just after it was right after my 40th birthday, I uh, just accepted that and left. Sold my apartment and my art studio and got rid of everything and moved. And everyone was like, oh my God, he's having like a midlife crisis. He's lost it. <laughs> <laughs> and it, but it was, and it was a big move like in every way. But prior to that, I grew up sort of in a small town and uh, uh, I had a friend that I met in kindergarten because we were seated right next to each other and we've been lifelong friends since. So he's like my brother, like I've known him my whole life. And we were artists already from very early. All we did was meet and draw every weekend and stuff. And growing up, we got to know this guy called uh, Svea H. Christensen, who was a really prolific underground comic artist, um, way ahead of his time. And he did all these insane comic books, um, Little Hitler and Donald Fuck and like all these crazy comic books. He had an obsession with Charles Manson right. and the case yeah. and everything. So he worked a lot of that into his comics, a lot of his views on Bruno Scorsese and the case and everything into it and Manson and his lyrics and some of, some of all that into his comic books. Now, that was way before the internet or whatever. Uh, so he had amassed this, I would say, pretty uh, impressive um sort of um following from like-minded sort of geeks freaks like him where he would exchange tapes and uh s scratch tapes they were called like the first early video um tapes where you, you actually combine footage yourself and he had a he had a crazy band called uh El what was it called uh, Anus Presley, <laughs> um, and um, he actually had me play on that, and uh, so I came over, I didn't have a guitar, so he had a guitar, like a lousy one, and then uh, he asked me to play something, and he didn't have a guitar pick either, so, or I didn't, so he gave me a fork, so I played oh with that fork, and then um, next time I came over, I brought a guitar pick, 
and started doing something to lay down some tracks. And he was like, no, no, man, it was way better when you played with the fork. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so he was that kind of guy. And he had one thing going that he loved to scare the shit out of me and my friend with, right. with footage. Like he would show, I don't know where he got it or how, but it was very early on, like in the 80s. So it would be like some guy who would on, on a podium giving a, a speech. He had somehow funneled money from his company or something and out of a brown paper bag, he pulls a gun and shoots his head off. Oh, and, shit. And it's real, right? So, right. and a lot of stuff about the Manson family, the Source family, the, you know, Church of Bob, you know, all these crazy things. So we got that sort of in early on and it became like this fascination and huge thing already as a teenager. So, right. so the, I would say I sort of fell into it early on and then, but the way that I met Aesop is a story in itself is uh, we had moved to LA. I was fascinated again with just the history of Los Angeles and the, oh, that's where Sinatra had its restaurant and that's where James Dean and this and that and blah, blah, blah. So one thing I would frequently do is um, after working on my computer all day, I'd go down to this little bar around the corner called the Frolic Room. Because it, it's the best you used to go if you wanted information back in the day, you'd go to the library. Now you go to the bar. So like, oh, yeah, yeah, perfect. So I would go in and sort of just, you know, ear, eavesdrop on some of the old geezers sitting around telling stories of, oh, yeah, I used to be a roadie for, you know, whatever, or. I was in TV and I was, so I walk in this one day and there's, there's Aesop, he's sitting at the bar and um, he's got his little dog lady and there's only one seat left at the bar. So I sit down next to him and um, pet his dog and like the dog comes up and he goes, ah, oh, that's unusual. She's not really like that with, with strangers. And I was like, well, she seems sweet and like blah, blah, blah. So we started talking. We talked for hours. Uh, I mean, it was broad daylight when I walked in, and it was pitch black when I walked out. <laughs> it's like one of the right. happened. Um, but so, in the course of that conversation, because of my curiosity with all this, and clearly from what he was telling me, he had been through a lot of the eras that defined a lot of events here in uh, Los Angeles. So I would ask about this and that, and it was like just sitting there talking to a lexicon of knowledge, right? right. And fascinating, you could just like tell stories about everything. And then it fell on the uh, Source family, because I just watched a documentary about it, and he was like, oh yeah, I knew Father Yo. And I was like, oh, really? And he's like, yeah, he was uh, blah, blah, blah. And so he told me some stories about him, he was a Marine, uh, just like Aesop was in the Marines. And I think they sort of initially had some bond on that. And there were some crazy stories. He told me that because uh, we found out later in our research that a lot of these people, being it from the Manson group or the Source family, kind of crossed over. And there were certain members that would just kind of go from one to the other. And one of the things that happened was that there was this one girl who was considered problematic uh, because she had been with the Manson group. And Father Yod pulled Aesop aside and tried to get him to marry her because he knew that Aesop had also been with the Manson family. And so that he could sort of rein her in and bring her like more into what their life was which was more like peace and love and uh, all that, um, which Aesop declined. Uh, and it, which was unusual because maybe because they were both Marines or whatever, um, Father Yoda let that slide and said, okay, that's that's okay. Because normally we didn't like to say, no, man, I'm not going to do that. You'd be out, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You, you did what you were told. But um Right. But so anyway, so back to the bar, why 
at some point we had been talking about all this. So, and then I go, so yeah, because inevitably when you start talking about these things, everything lead up to Manson because it was such a defining moment in time that changed the history of Los Angeles pretty much. Yeah. And so he said, um, in typical Aesop fashion, he goes, yeah, I knew Charlie too. And I go, wait a minute, you know of him or you knew him? And he was like, no, I, I knew Charlie and Charlie knew me. We got along fine. And I, my head was just tripping, you know. For sure. I right. couldn't believe what I was hearing and, or if he was pull, pulling my leg or right. whatever. And then at some point, and this is the end of the bar story, and then um, at some point we go outside to smoke a cigarette. Right. We both share the same vice, I guess. There. So we go out because in, in LA, it's it's a crime to smoke cigarettes. You can smoke crack, and everyone is all, oh, thank God it's just crack. But if yeah. you smoke a cigarette, <laughs> it's literally that is bad. But anyway, so right. you know, they're smoking a cigarette. And then yeah. suddenly he goes, You seem to know a lot about um, this whole Manson thing. And uh, of the history of it, and I was like, yeah, well, uh, you know, I just think it's really fascinating, and I can't believe you you knew him, and I had like a million things I wanted to ask him, but I learned already that as soon as I started asking, he sort of withdrew. It's okay. not something he wanted to talk about, essentially. He had already overspoken in, in some way, so he sort of leaned back on that. But then when we were outside, and he goes, yeah, you seem to know a lot about him, blah, blah, blah. He goes, so what do you know about 28 Clubhouse? Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything about 28 Clubhouse at all. Like, this is the first time I ever heard it. So in a weird coincidence, roundabout way, I said zero, meaning I know nothing. And it sounds right. like now, <laughs> but that's what I said. And suddenly, right. he, before uh, sorry, before we move on, just for people who don't know, yeah, what is what is this place that we're talking about? Twenty Eight Clubhouse was a uh, house in Venice Beach that uh, Aesop owned, and he ended up living with four of the Manson girls and two of the most you know, prolific killers of the group mm. as groupies. And one of the people that they brought in was this guy called Zero. And um, he was murdered or died with, uh, and, and the thing is it was the police report officially said that, uh, that it was a suicide. Apparently he played Russian roulette and blew his head off. And um, but the thing is also that that gun was Aesop's gun. So, uh, registered to him in his name and it was in his house and they found it and uh or knew where it was somehow and to make it all more crazy he was in acting school so he wasn't at the house when it happened he was taking acting classes with uh lawrence merrick who was another okay guy. we can come back to lawrence merrick was also sharon tate's acting teacher um not at the same yeah. time, but so the whole thing is just very convoluted, and um, I know all this now, but at the time I didn't know any of this. Right. So when I said zero, um, it was like a switch went off in his head, and he just suddenly went in a very different tone. He was just like, That's fucking right, that was my fucking gun, and he was shot with my gun, and he suddenly became sort of aggressive. And I was like, whoa, dude. Wow. Uh, I had no idea what was what just happened. Or so I I I, I was just um, kind of like put out my cigarette and like, try to get back inside with the dog and just be like, hey, everything's cool, man. Uh, let me buy you another uh, round. And, and then I went on my way and I went home and I literally on my way home I called my wife and I was just like, you're not gonna believe what just happened. And uh, so I went home and we spent that whole night, I think, just Googling and stumbling upon all these message boards that are on different sites discussing who's Mark Ross. 
Where is Mark Ross? Why does he have all these different names? Where did he go? He lives in Canada. He worked for the CIA. He was planted on Spawn Ranch. Like, Ooh, out there. And all of that suddenly sort of, it just clicked um, that, wow, Aesop Aquarium is Mark Ross, is Mark Rosen, is Steve Morell, is so-and-so and so-and-so. It's all the same person. And I just had like drinks with him. My mind was blown. Mm, wow. Sure. I can, <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Just, yeah. Wow. But so that, that actually just led to once that we had sort of found that out, Maya and I were, because we're writers, you know, so we like a good mystery and uh, like to Google around and, um, so basically, uh, he ended up contacting me again because I gave him my card. Okay, um, yeah. So he ended up calling me again and asked if um, I wanted to meet him back at the frolic and have a drink. So I said, yeah. Um, and then I was like, but uh, would you, could you mind if I bring my wife? And uh, he was like, no, certainly. And then I said, oh, by the way, um, <laughs> you know, we found out that so and so and so and so and so. And he just, he kind of flipped out. He got really, really, um, I think, scared and defensive and just freaked out okay. that yeah. we had sort of figured out who he was and he knew we were writers, you know? Mm. Right. And, uh, suddenly he was just like, oh man, and, like I could tell he, he was freaking. So, even more reason to meet him and say in person and have him meet my wife and say, you have nothing to fear from us. We're not going to like sell your story to Rolling Stone or like, blah, blah, blah. Uh, right. but so that, that led to a friendship that over the years, like really became just a very, very close friendship with him. We just ended up like loving this guy because he was a, he was a, just one of the most unusual people, really. He was like Mensa level, uh, you know, intelligent. Talk talk about anything. Uh, the more that we, the more that we started talking about, look, Aesop. Um, I mean, we have to ask, you know, like, uh, how about a book? You know, it's kind of what we do, and you really have a story here. And he was just like, oh, people have been after me for so many years about it, and blah blah blah. He, he just didn't want to do it. Um, right. And we were like, okay, that's cool. Um, so then I gave him like two drinks, and I was like, so hey, he's up. I'm not a book, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, Often him up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So so it just it, it sort of eased him into it a little bit more over time, and right. I think as his as his situation sort of got um, more dire with his health. It became a thing where we were like, Aesop, look, we, this is what we do. We can sell a proposal. We don't have to write a whole book. We could do a proposal, three chapters, a good synopsis, you know, a good pitch. We could put that together. It's what we do for a living. We do it for a lot of people. We don't necessarily end up writing their books, but we sell it. And then they can either write it, you know, themselves or hire someone cheaper or whatever. And then so where Aesop started thinking about it sort of in a way where, okay, well, maybe maybe I could make some money. You know, we could get a good advance. Uh, he could put it towards his living conditions and his health and his just in general. And I thought I think maybe that um that changed things. And then once we started digging into that. Because we knew that Aesop wasn't going to be able to pay us what we normally get paid to do these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, he didn't have that money. So then Maya and I started thinking, well, because it does take a while to, and it's a lot of work to put into it to actually sell it. So, um, so, we, so we started interviewing him a lot. Um, and for the first time ever, he started really talking about these things, Manson his yeah. relationship with the girls, his time on the ranch, the trial, uh, his time with 
you know, Father Yo, military, all his world travels, and just fabulous stories that um, we really look forward to be able to share it with everybody at some point uh, right. with this project. But uh, but then he, um, so yeah, so we, we thought, okay, suddenly he started getting more and more sick. So we're like, okay, what do we do? So we thought, okay, we, in a roundabout, we knew a reporter at the Hollywood Reporter. We set up some sort of uh, guidelines and, and agreed on a couple of things that sadly didn't. He didn't end up uh, honoring in the end for for my and I. But the article manifested, and um, and we, so we spent a lot of time on that because the whole idea with that article because Aesop didn't want to do. Um, in the first place. So that's not what he wanted to do. But we we were telling him, look, this is a way for it to come out in a mainstream magazine. They have a good reputation. They do a lot of you know, um, in-depth reporting on stuff. And your, your story is totally different. And we could use that article as the proposal, basically. Mm. So we were sort of, in a way, side-tracking uh, the process, both time-wise and money-wise, of course, it ended up being ten times as much work time-wise. Right. But anyway, um, um, but that's sort of how that whole thing came about. That's incredible. That is just like what a uh, one of those things. It's like swimming with the current. All yeah. of a sudden, it's just here. You are in the middle of this giant amount of information. Yeah. And and so you ended up becoming close with them and how long were you guys doing this for how many years before I would say he we, met him, um, we moved to LA from New York so six and a half years ago we met him pretty much right after um, I would say probably six years uh, where in the last three years it, it became more and more focused on this project um, right. And we continue to do all our other work and stuff, but uh, we would spend a lot of time with Aesop and take him out and go to places. He would take us to various locations, show us, you know, different stuff. And um, so, yeah, it was. Uh, and then when he got sick, everything changed because then he was suddenly homebound. We couldn't, right. we couldn't go out with him. And then so it became suddenly it became more and more a transition into suddenly my and I becoming almost his uh, you know, caretakers. There was a lot of work towards the end that uh, involved in us just trying to fix shit for him. Um, right. Call, you know, uh, hospice places, call um, people to come and take care of him. Uh, and it seemed like the more people that got involved, the more chaotic it Came and nothing got done. And it's just right. the healthcare system here is um, not the greatest, I would say, as a day. No. But yeah. Um, so I got to really see that firsthand, and uh, uh, I had just been through the whole thing. Sadly, with my both my parents passed away rather suddenly, and then uh, uh, during the pandemic, and we had to go to Denmark and do all that. And when we came back. You know, Aesop's health really started getting worse and worse. And I think that's around the time where the former incarnation of the Abraxas Circle website uh, yeah. by Nicholas Freck, the former yeah. site that was uh, had far more uh, 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 people on it, uh, that, that, was, that became sort of a kind of a big thing in our research and it ended up with i think um, i must have reached out to nicholas i don't believe he reached out to me but i i think i reached out to him and we ended up talking um and uh it was very different than i would have imagined he was just a very very uh sweet person and uh, he was mm -hmm. we had a lot of things unexpectedly uh, sort of in common I used to have a, an art studio in uh, Berlin with a friend of mine for some years. And, and so we talked about a lot of that. And, 
art and things here in Los Angeles where he lived and in New York. And so it took like 40 minutes until we got to the, again, the elephant in the room, Charles Mings. Yes. But then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then we started talking a lot about that and he's helped us a tremendous, um, uh, just a, in a tremendous way with uh, fact checking a lot of things and checking dates and locations uh, with our information and uh, continue to do so. Actually, yeah, so, um, absolutely. He's done. He's yeah. done a lot of that sort of stuff. Yeah. He's super generous. Yeah. when mm -hmm. it comes to information yeah. and, and and in a weird way, he got involved in the whole thing with Aesop dying also because. I really wanted uh, Aesop to, to talk to Nicholas. Nicholas, of course, would like to talk to Aesop about a lot of the events and stuff because of his knowledge on, on, on those subjects. And, uh, and uh, actually it came to a point because, you know, Aesop didn't really want to talk to anybody, but I told and look, he, this guy is like a little out of the ordinary. He's an expert on this. And he knew Charles Manson, and he's a Buddhist. And then I think that sold it to him, and he agreed to talk to Nicholas because uh, Aesop found Buddhism early on in the 70s, and it was something that always meant a lot to him. Yeah. Both in philosophy and, uh, you know, reading and his writings. And he had... Uh, I actually have his little his little Buddha here next to my my desk. Oh, look at that! I'm gonna make you big so people can see that. Oh, nice. Just one yeah. There you go. It's, uh, cool. It's just one of many little uh, you know figurines he had uh, of this nature, and um, and so. But then, sadly, it, like. One of the things that really messed a lot of things up also with the Hollywood Reporter and the interviews and our process with him and the, the getting him to talk to Nicholas was that his voice set out. So he couldn't okay. talk. I mean, he, he was all there and he was fine, and uh, but he, he just couldn't talk. Mm -hmm. uh, that made it really difficult to sort of get these things done. Right. Right. And so how was it? that there was no voice there to be had, or he just his, he just couldn't get... Just he talk. had... Um, I'm not sure what it's called. C-O-D. C-O-D? C-O-D. C-O-D? Um, okay. Something, uh, it, it was something, in a, and he had, a, you know, just issues with his lungs, and he, he had a lot of things. He, he His whole life, he was martyred with a, like, Pain from he had a bad motorcycle accident. He um, he got I think it was pneumonia when he was in the Marines. Uh, he just had a lot of things that sort of you know, he had to deal with his whole life. Right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Some that people. Part, that particular part was like the worst because uh, we go over there. We'd, I'd make him tea, or I'd make him like his favorite, like ramen with coffee, and, you know, a twist of lemon, and hope that that would help, or buy him, you know, whatever we could think of that would make his voice better, so that we could right. talk. Uh, and um, but it just got worse and worse. So. Man, so how did you how did you work around that? Was he able to write? Was he able to type, or anything like that? No, uh, actually, that was by the end. Oh, um, gotcha. Okay. It was by the end, and um, and there wasn't really that much, and that that happened after the Hollywood Reporter was finalized, but the article hadn't come out yet. So okay. we were basically, um, and that was his big final moment, you know, when he, he finally got out of his apartment for the first yeah. time in like two years, walked down the stairs with the oxygen tank and like tubes and. The, the hospice guy was there and we were there and everybody and but then and he was so nervous like he he just it had like I said we had already canceled it four times prior but it was his big you know Desdemona Mona, like, like walking uh, uh, Norma Desmond Norma rather uh, walking down the, the stairs uh, coming out and actually 
doing it. The photographer took all of these amazing pictures, and but he didn't say anything. There was no interviewing after or during that. No, no, so, right? Wow. And yeah. that would be some of those older pictures. Wait a second here, because you actually sent me a whole lot of pictures. Yeah. And now that you say that, I can pull up, I believe, is it, uh, hang on a sec here, get to the right one. Would uh, this be the moment you're talking about? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's actually one of my favorite pictures, he uh, sort of just looking up in the sky. Um, but you could see he was walking with a cane. He, I had literally dressed him, like completely. Um, right. He was breathing through the, uh, you know, oxygen machine. And yep. just a big. Um, it was just a big sort of ordeal to get all this. Oh yeah, and his beard. My God, we went through. So much to get his beard done because he was very, very that that's where the actor in him comes in. <laughs> he, he was very sort of particular about how he should look for this. So at first I was like sent on the craziest goose chase to find this barber, um, Floyd's, uh, where yeah. he would have his beard done back in the day and stuff. And I, I literally went through really everything to get that guy to come and do it, and he couldn't do it. And he's oh my goodness, even more furious. And so we ended up getting this um, girl who worked at Paramount at the lot next to where he lived, and she was able to come over and literally in the morning do his beard the, the day of the shoot. And then when we came over, he still wasn't satisfied with the beard. So my wife literally sat there and like beat it and like whatever. Uh, it was such a production with that beard. That was oh, beautiful. that's so beautiful. funny. Yeah. So you see this guitar he has here. That was one of his, uh, that's the Taylor guitar. It's one of his nice guitars and 12 string. Um, yeah. He, um, the strap on that right there. Yeah. At the end. So that's this one that was also in the Hollywood Reporter, I can show you this guitar strap that the um, the, the girls made for. Him. Oh, wow. <gasps> so, you know, they uh, they were pretty handy and they did uh, all kinds of them. Wow. Right. So, but she, I guess they, um, I don't know if they made it when they were sitting outside in the during the trial or it was on the ranch but they didn't make it for him right and it's in the hollywood reporter the um yeah they took you were talking about they said that uh bruce davis had mentioned that he was a hell of a 12 string player yeah when he yeah. was asked about it yeah and that's another thing about aesop because he he uh the many lives of aesop aquarian he uh he had a long uh, acting career. He was in so many movies, so many TV shows, all kinds of appearances. He did a lot of theater in his young days. And then he, um, uh, you know, also had this big career as a singer. Oh, wow. and, um, traveled the world, appeared on all kinds of weird TV shows in Hong Kong and all kinds of stuff where he was playing. Um, he was literally on the Gong Show. Um, <laughs> yeah, that story is amazing. Can you yeah. tell the Gong Show story? Yeah, well, I, I mean, hey, uh, we just found the footage the other day, actually. Um, oh, really? Yeah, nice. we've, we've had to buy a lot of uh, like outdated sort of media to be able to play all these things we found uh, right. in his belongings, like just uh, you know VCRs and eight tracks and like weird players to play this and that but we so we yeah. found the gong show and it's it's amazing he comes out and uh with that guitar uh and a cowboy hat and his outfit and then he goes uh i've been very lonesome since my horse died and then he bows and goes away before they can gong him yeah <laughs> so, yeah because he he knew they had 30 seconds or something. Yeah. He said he had 30 yeah. seconds. So he did like 20 or whatever it was. And they, they all had, had to give him like top grades. <laughs> oh, that's, that's funny. so yeah. funny. 
he was just uh, it's like really funny like that. Um, You're right. And, and there's a lot of said other, something. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, there's just a lot of other uh, stuff like that that we have uncovered. Uh, just amazing stories and footage and in his notebooks and things that we have interviewed him about that just blew our mind from that period right. of time that um, I think people are going to get a big kick out of. So he knew, and this uh, this was mentioned as well in the article, that he, one of his roommates was had a pretty famous name. His father was a pretty big deal. Was it his roommate, Frank Sinatra Jr.? Right. That was in the uh, early 60s when um, Aesop was kind of a troublemaker, uh, as you could imagine, when he was a teen. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so he was sent to the Desert Sun School. And uh, in that school, he um, ended up, you know, by coincidence in uh, dorm number four, where his roommates were uh, Frank Sinatra Jr., and um, oh, what's his name? Uh, he's, he became a famous installation artist, Richard Shaw. Uh, and they, there was a lot of great pictures, and we found a lot. We found his yearbook, and um, you know, Richard Shaw. His work is now, you know, in the Smithsonian and uh, like all kinds wow. of big collections. And they were just having a ball. You know, back then they were like 16 and getting in trouble and pulling pranks and and uh, that's them, right? That is them. That is he's up there on uh, in the um, cowboy jacket with a big beard and Frank Sinatra Jr. in the white shirt, Richard Shaw. Yeah. And unfortunately, I'm not sure who the um, guy with the glasses is. Right. That's a man. But that was at the reunion, the 50th uh, reunion. And, um, and and there's great footage and a lot of stuff that we also have that uh, that uh, actually uh, Frank Sinatra Jr. put on a big show um, where he invited everybody to come to the show. And uh, they were all sitting on stage as he performed and, uh, and everything. So it, it was a big deal. And... Um, there was a, like a, a CD that was produced by the Desert Sun School that's narrated by by Frank, and where he tells the whole story of uh, the school and you know what they did and how they did it and all their routines and, and then all the pranks that they would pull on each other. Um, right. And they remain friends, uh, Aesop and Frank, um, throughout their life and. Uh, uh, he talked a little bit about, you know, the, that whole thing when uh, Frank Sinatra Jr. was kidnapped and it was a big um, scandal and uh, like all, all this stuff. But, oh, yeah, I wanted to show you. Uh, so uh, Aesop actually had on his wall and I asked, hey, what's this? It's like a sketch drawings. But these were actually done by Richard Shaw. And um, wow. Oh my God! That one of the cowboy and the one next to the cowboy—that's actually Frank Sinatra Jr. When he was. Oh okay. Nice. Yeah. Oh my God! Imagine just having a couple of sketches from Mark Shaw. In your house. <laughs> like, he's I mean, just... he's pretty—he's uh, pretty prolific. I didn't really know who he was, but uh, when I checked him out, he—he um, he does wonderful, like sort of quirky uh, stuff. A lot of his sculptures are just really, really funny. There's a lot of humor to his stuff, you know, um, uh, installation art like this, found objects and like uh, wow. cool, cool stuff. Um, That's neat. I'll have, Very cool. Yeah, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to get these. He's actually the only one of them who is still alive now, Richard Shaw. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'd yeah. like to get in contact with him, tell him we have this. Hopefully he doesn't want it back. <laughs> um, <laughs> but just also just to get him to talk to us about that time. Because yeah. right, that must have been uh, a lot of fun. No kidding. <laughs> I, I wonder if any uh, 
did any stories from um from the Manson stuff leak over because as we look more and more into it um there's little little hints of the mob around and stuff and being that Frank Sinatra senior was pretty mobbed up um yeah I think that part is pretty well established now that um old blue eyes was pretty tight with the mob <laughs> yeah it was pretty Just a little. yeah uh yeah there was a lot of suitcases that went you know <laughs> over the border with uh millions of dollars uh, right like that but uh he um to to that effect aesop didn't tell me anything or maya anything that would indicate that um that frank jr was involved in any i mean that was also later of course and uh, right of course yeah 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 <clears throat> but i mean the fact that he was kidnapped alone and all that there's it's pretty know, crazy um yeah. so being that we're the main focus of our thing is the stuff surrounding manson how did why we go into how did he meet manson and how was he affiliated with the right family? so <clears throat> um what happened was that um i think it all actually takes place around the same time when aesop lived at 28 clubhouse in uh, in venice Right. And he ended up being roommates with uh, Claudia and Country Sue and Little Patty and Catherine Gillies. Those okay. Four. And then Bruce Davis and Bill Vance. Okay. <clears throat> now, he always said, um, you know, Bill Vance and Bruce Davis, he was like, well, they were ex-cons. They, they just grew beards and long hair to camouflage his hippies. But they were... Right. They were cons, like Manson. That's right. That's how he he saw Bruce Davis and Bill Vance. Yeah, and Bruce Davis is interesting because he um, he actually played a bigger role than I think most people realize because he is, he was very um, into Scientology, and Scientology was just you know at that time becoming like the new big thing. And, um, he studied with Hubbard in, uh, in England and came over. And uh, so he had real firsthand knowledge of right. psychology. And that was something that was really a big deal at 28 Clubhouse, that they were, they were constantly psychoanalyzing each other, using all those techniques. And it was just a, it sounded, to me, it sounded like kind of a circus there a little bit because everybody was naked and running around having sex. Uh, there was one room in the house called the shy room where, you know, uh, if you couldn't, if you couldn't have sex with a, you know, in front of everybody, you, you could go to the shy room, but then everybody sort of knew that you just couldn't right. eat. And ironically, that's also where uh, Zero ended his days. Okay. Right. Because it was the only private place in yeah. the house. Yeah, kind of. Because everything else was just open and shared. And and uh, but but so the the what he has told me is the so after Zero was shot. So at first, Aesop always you know said, yeah, well, <clears throat> you know, the suicide the, the, and that. But towards the end, he actually said, well, I've had a lot of time to think about this. And the odds that it wasn't, that he wasn't murdered, is just unlikely. Yeah. Given the people who were in the house. Right. You know, it was just like, it, 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 I, and I tend to agree, it seems kind of unlikely. <laughs> um, yeah. But, um, and then he did say that uh, the day after the the day after Zero died, uh, Bill Vance just hightailed out of there immediately and took one of the girls. I think it was Claudia uh, or Catherine. One of them went with him and never came back. Interesting. Right after Zero's death. Wow. The day after. Yeah. The day after. 
Mm -hmm. Wow, I didn't know that. Right. So, so, so there's definitely some, um, you know, sketchy things going. And Bill Vance was, from what I've been able to find out about him, uh, a real sketchy mofo. You know? Right. Okay. Did he? Did um? Did Aesop talk much about Vance? In like, like, did he tell you stories about him not to do with that yeah, incident? I mean, um, it's funny because. The way he talked, at once, on the one hand, he was like they were cons, right? Mm -hmm. Established cons. Like they were just masquerading as hippies, but they were not. They were they were different than all the other ones, right? But right. at the time, at the time that they were at his house, was already there was already a lot of uh, things that had gone on at Spawn Ranch. There's already a lot of heat on Spawn Ranch, which is why that they ended up living with him. Okay, yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. And Aesop at the time was kind of uh, not privy to really the full picture of what was going on, why they were there, what was happening on Spawn Ranch, all that stuff. So right. what happened was so remember I said uh, he was in acting school with uh, Lawrence Merrick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so Lawrence Merrick was also um, um, and, and uh, Hendrickson, right? Yeah, and Hendrickson, yeah. And Hendrickson. So, so basically what was happening was that um, Hendrickson was shooting a movie starring Aesop as Jesus. Okay. Uh, and it was already in production. They were shooting. There was a script. Um, he was the lead playing Jesus and sort of the, the premise of the whole thing was that he was Jesus, but he didn't know he was Jesus. Um, so, so he was like the return of Jesus, but he didn't know he was Jesus. Right. So anyway, uh, and there's footage in the, uh, in Hendrickson's, uh, Manson movie of that. Some of those oh, okay. scenes are from that movie. Um, and that's the the Hendrickson movie. For those who don't know, is the 1970s Manson documentary yes. with all yeah. the you. If you see any pictures of the girls with rifles or any shots of Spawn Ranch, them running around, that's mm -hmm. the movie that it came from. Yes, and and so and also the following movie that he released with the remaining footage. I think it was in 2007 or something. Um, and uh, which has a lot more footage of, of Mark Ross in it. Okay. Oh, and was that the uh, Inside the Manson Gang? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot more footage in that. I find that actually more interesting because of just the fact that there's way more uh, stuff with. Uh, right. With We've heard a lot about that, that there's more. Um, and do, do you, any idea where that stuff is? <laughs> like who's well, that's one thing that uh, it's a good question because there there is a lot of ideas about it. Maybe uh, as you know now, Hendrickson is long gone. His uh, his you know Aesop told me that he spent the better part of twenty years to try and get a hold of Hendrickson's wife. Um, really. Well, that's a, more a part of the story of how this came about. So, so circling back a little bit. So, when he was when he was starring in the Jesus movie, suddenly that he was already living with the girls, and okay, and Bill and Bruce. And so one day he goes to Hendrix and hey, how would you like to shoot a documentary about the hottest topic in town? And he goes, what do you mean? He's like, well, the Manson trial, the, what's going on? And he goes, well, yeah, I would love that, but how? And uh, Aesop goes, I think I can make that happen because I know them. And he was like, really? Um, so Aesop actually followed up on that and talked to the girls, ended up going into jail to talk to Manson about this, getting the green light for Hendrickson to be able to go on the ranch and start shooting the movie. Yeah. Uh, so that's how that came about. But that said, um, 
the movie that they wanted to shoot and the, the movie that um, Aesop pitched to Manson was very, very different and what what Manson's ideas were and uh, so forth. And Aesop said, in the end, Hendrickson just ended up discarding all of Manson's ideas, most, most of Aesop's ideas, and just ran with it and did his own thing, which ended up being more salacious and, you know, the rest. And it's just more orchestrated. And, you know, he sat the girls down and, like, hold this gun, say something crazy. Uh, you know, like, yeah, yeah, you know, not the movie that they were going to make at all, right? Um, but so, following that, um, after Aesop brokered the deal, he ended up moving out to Spawn Ranch. Um, and I actually, uh, I had something wrong with it. this was also in the Hollywood Reporter. This is actually an old. An old um, temporary driver's license from. Oh wow! It's a, where it's addressed, Mark Stephen Ross, Spawn Ranch. So that's in 1970. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's in uh, yeah 1970. So that's when we know that he officially moved out there, and uh, we have a lot of his poems and stuff that he wrote out on on the ranch. Right, and and, uh, and stuff like that. I believe you. Some of those, there's uh, pictures of them. In yeah, the, in the stuff you sent me, oh, I can. Um, yeah, just show a couple of the things in the Manson area. That, of course, is uh, from Black Angel, which is uh, the movie that he started in uh, prior to all of this happening. Okay. Oh, okay. But look, with Lawrence Merrick. Okay. Spawns not January nineteen seventy, it says right at the bottom there. Yeah. Unreal. And there's a lot of these poems that uh I'm uh pretty excited because my wife and I have talked to Nicholas about cross referencing a lot of his poetry that was written under those circumstances. And you can see his handwriting gets more and more crazy. His thoughts are more and more all over the place. Uh, yeah. They're starting to go, some, some shit starting to go down on the ranch that makes him worried and fear for his life. And it all right. goes into his writing. And so we're talking to Nicholas about sort of cross-referencing these things to find right. out what exactly was happening on those specific days. Uh, right. This this one is uh, so we found a whole bunch of clippings in um, in uh, Aesop's stuff. He he had saved a lot of newspaper articles from this time, and you can see, of course, there he is. Uh, I've spoken to that baby. That's Ivan. That's Ivan Pugh. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. That's uh, he's actually an amazing chef. And started uh, Bucky Moonshines, which is a restaurant in Texas. Oh, wow. And he's a he's a he's a prolific dude. He is a really cool guy, and just very very centered with with how he was brought up. It's that's so cool. But that's neat that that's him there, and then Mark Ross right behind him. Wow, that's wild. Yeah. yeah. Um. Uh, I have actually a question, a kind of a side note. I'm not sure mm -hmm. because a lot of people are kind of confused as to what the ranch was and what the the family was and all that sort of thing. Like, was it a was it a like crazy cult? Was it a, a just a regular commune like any other one that was going on there? Was Manson the head of the commune, their mm -hmm. guru? Like, kind of some of those things did. Um, did Aesop put the ranch into more perspective for you in any way? Well, he, um, I mean, he, he did say a lot of things among them. Like he, so what happened was he, uh, he moved out of his Venice beach house, uh, to move, to live with them on the ranch. And he said they were just doing acid all the time. And constantly, 
And he was known as the trip master because he had such a high tolerance for acid that he, he could literally, you know, when they would go dumpster diving or whatever, he would be driving because he was he could drive while being all fucked up. Wow. Um, oh, wow. So, yeah. uh, and also he was older than them, you know? And right. uh, and all, one of the things I think also, again, like uh, Jim Baker, or Father Yo, one of the things with Manson that I think made him give Mark uh, the sort of authority that he ended up having on the ranch by he would give he would sort of give him responsibility of transporting the girls to and from court every single day. Uh, it was unusual for for Manson to let a guy like Asa, who was like six foot tall. Uh, you know, take care of his girls because all the other guys on the ranch were like shorter. And, and uh, I, from what I've understood, Manson didn't really like having anybody like to be way taller than him. He dies. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> and uh, there's something I can read to you a little later uh, about that. But um, so what happened was that he basically, Aesop had to, in his mind, Pretend that he did not own that house in Venice. He all, he all, he, he, uh, you know, all, always told them that he rented it, that it wasn't his house because, uh, you know, he he soon found out that it was like everything, any money had to go to Manson, right? As mm -hmm. with any, okay. uh, whatever commune or cult like that, uh, whatever you call it. The commune, I think that that makes sense that there was the head of that because there was the guy at the head of the pig farm, the yeah. head of the rest of them. Yeah, go ahead. So it's like you arrive on a bus and give everything you own to the guy and you're in. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, but no, of course there's more to it. But so so uh, so Aesop was um, he ended up losing his house in Venice because when when things started getting more when there was more tension. On the ranch, like for instance, there he had a beautiful um, live-in van that he had out there, and one night he was just torched. Um, oh. His van was just burned to a crisp. And, and so, that, and that happened. Was there anything that led up to his his van being torched? Well, there's there's so there's things like there was all you know. Suddenly he was approached on the ranch. Uh, and whether that was on Manson's orders or that was just somebody on the ranch telling him to do this, it was enough that he freaked out because he was told to kill uh, Burles Gosi and the prosecutor. Okay. And they knew that Aesop was in the Marines and that he knew his way around, you know, weapons and stuff like that. Uh, and, and that he had a gun at his house. And all that. Um, so he started from what he told us. It was a series of sort of events um, that made him more and more nervous because at first he was just really, really torn up because he loved that live in van and it was so beautiful. It was all custom made and had a kitchen and a bed and all kinds of things. Uh, and, you know, the. Um, let me see. Um, oh yeah, the the official story of that incident was that uh, Paul Watkins, little Paul, uh, mm -hmm. fell asleep with a cigarette in in the van, and that's how it happened. And the whole van went up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. What, that's what he was told, and uh, you know, Aesop obviously knew him from out there and stuff, and. So at first, I think from what he told us, he was he chalked it up to it was an accident, right? And just a sad accident. But then he sort of, when when things started becoming more and more hairy and the weird things started escalating, he, he thought of things differently. He was like, "Well, what if what if it was not an accident? What's the message?" Uh, what do they want me to do? And they come and ask him to, to kill the prosecutor and, and those ghosts again. And so things like that, I think just basically 
And imagine also that you're totally high on acid the whole time at the same time. So the paranoia must have been, you know, uh, overwhelming. Uh, Pretty next level, yeah. It's yeah. interesting that one of the clippings that you sent mm -hmm. has um, all-out drug war. Yeah. concedes creates narcotics, and on the same page, there's the Manson stuff. Yeah. 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 But I think what a lot of people maybe overlook a little bit when it comes to all this, specifically with Spawn Ranch, is <clears throat> I know there's a lot of people saying that, you know, they, they were just hippies and it was free love and everything was cool until it was not cool. But the thing is that, I mean, there was a lot of drugs and dealing and it was all about getting money for drugs or selling drugs to get money to mm -hmm. get drugs, to get more money to like it was just I mean so so the, there was a lot of the, there's a lot of that that doesn't really fit in with the whole peace love narrative because there was a lot of robberies there was a lot of just a lot of stuff that would suggest a little bit of a different narrative right I, a lot of a lot of criminals. Yeah, it seemed yeah. more like a more like a biker club than a commune. But that being said, a lot of the stuff I read about communes now, they were all kind of just like they all had a bit of a a bit of stuff like this going on. Yeah, yeah, a bit of the yeah. illegal. Um, so I'm just going through some of the. Is there you you sent me a bunch of pictures, mm -hmm. and um, they're in a few different. Uh, different sections now is there any was there any which way you wanted to go through them um Not really and it wasn't meant that you were supposed to just show all of it because it was just if there was anything you find particularly interesting oh okay cool yeah there's it, yeah. it's funny you uh you showed that um that strap of the guitar yeah now i just see as i'm going through stuff that's it here's that strap that's the close-up of it i have a question yeah you yeah. had mentioned um a shop's involvement with uh father yod as well i'm just curious how that how his connection to father yod and that whole situation uh, commune came about and then if um Aesop ever compared the two in any way uh well the way first of all the way that it came about was after all this happened um revolving around the trial and you know uh Aesop actually ended up getting thrown in jail himself for five days for shouting at the judge and uh, and all that. And um, okay, so after after he started, it's like after everything started falling apart, uh, and he he really got concerned for his life and with good reason because a lot of people were just bumped off, you know. Um, right. Was there so, anything that? Were there any, sorry to stop you mid-story, but was there anything to do with that when he's saying that people were getting bumped off that he knew and he figured that it was it was coming on for him? Was there anything, like what were the things that pointed him in that direction that showed him that this I, is what these people are capable of? Yeah, I actually found something I was going to read for you. Um So, yeah, this is just a, this is a little segment from like one of our many interviews with, uh, with Aesop that I transcribed. And I thought I'd just read it uh, because maybe it, it will address it a little bit. So he says, I could not pretend when I came on board with the Manson people, I could not pretend that I didn't own my Venice house. I would be completely different than they were. I dropped acid with them, so I could not pretend, or they would find out. So I had to really not have it. So I walked away from a million dollar house and all the equity in it I had, and I paid the mortgage there for months after. When I bought it, I knew it was going to be incredibly valuable. I didn't know that the strip would be more popular than Disneyland, but I knew it was going to be a good investment. 
If I didn't let it go, they could have murdered me. Look what they did to Gary Hinman. They wanted money. He didn't give it to them, so they killed him. And Gary Hinman was their friend, like me. So they moved in with me, and they asked me for money, and I told them I didn't have any. I told them I was renting the house. If they found out I owned a million-dollar house, I'm not saying that they would have, but they certainly could have killed me to get that money as well. When you're talking about the family, you're talking about more than one finger on a hand. There's five fingers on a hand, and there's ten fingers on a person's hands. If you think of the Manson family as basically ten fingers on a hand, you're wrong. You have to look at the fingers that are there. Then you look at someone like Bruce Davis or Bill Vance, and you go, well, I don't know about this man. They've got a reputation, and suddenly, certainly, they've done it before, so who knows? Right. That's intense that he says that they have a reputation, and yeah. that both of them had certainly done it before. That's a really powerful statement from somebody who lived with them. But then he also, you know, it was kind of like... Um, Where was that? I think it was on the same thing I wanted to read you. Uh, Look at some more pictures while you're looking for that. Okay. Him drawing the parallels with like him and Hinman, that was wild. That's pretty intense too, isn't it? The, the parallels between him and Hinman. Yeah. This is, no, I think actually Aesop had a lot of uh, reason to, to fear for his life because he had suddenly gotten really, really tangled up in something that he, uh, I don't think, had any idea really what he had gotten into and how to get out of it again. Um, right. Because he also, uh, you know, suddenly, clearly he was he was in with Manson and then suddenly... Maybe if you were suddenly not in with him, then, hey, things could happen. Bad things could happen pretty quick. Um, right. Oh, there here is. And there's him with Country Sue was one of the people that was living at the house yeah. with him, you were saying? Yeah. And uh, there's and Catherine. Catherine Gillies. Yeah. yeah, there's Catherine Gillies, Nancy Pittman. I'm not quite sure who that is beside mark ross or beside aesop mm -hmm. a man crazy that's it that's wild so his job was basically just transporting these girls back and forth all the time every day uh sitting outside that's where there's so much footage and, and pictures of him with with the girls outside um you know just hanging killing time sitting around yeah uh, right <laughs> And look how young they are. I mean, it's just dude. Like I know they always show like um, the two on the. They throw Catherine Gillies and, yeah. and Sandra Good, who you know could pass as older teenagers. Mm -hmm. That girl on the right can't pass. Those two oh, gosh, girls no. or three girls on the right can't pass for older teenagers. No, I know those are, those I are kids. Here. I was a little shocked when I first saw that picture because. I was like, for, it was like I had to sec, take a second take. It was like, my God, they look like kids, like yeah, kids. <laughs> yeah, like those are that girl can't be over like fourteen. Right, and it's holy doodles. Yeah. yeah. Um. But um, but then there's something interesting also that uh, that happened while because Issa was under the impression that. Manson was innocent. He's he's told us that repeatedly, because right. as he said, he was like, "I've been I've been harassed by cops my whole life. They've arrested me. They've harassed me. I've had to prove that I was not guilty. They just assumed I was guilty." And so he hated authority and cops, uh, with with some good reason. And uh, so he said, "Well, if it could happen to me, it could happen to him." Um, right. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to wait for the trial. I want to see what happens. So 
So if you think he's done something, prove it. You know, right. And so, so that was that was also a part of a sort of um, Aesop's mindset on that. But a funny thing about it, it was that um, at this point uh, in time, uh, Manson hadn't really had any music out yet. That that came. Right. So so people didn't really know his music that much, um, but he had already recorded it uh, with uh, uh, Phil Kaufman. Yes, correct. And um, and actually, Kaufman knew Aesop. Aesop knew him. And uh, Aesop said he went to his house a couple of times and partied and stayed over with the girls. And, so, so he knew him, and so what, uh, what Aesop did was, <laughs> which is, so again, typical him, he, he took some of the recordings, and he said, okay, I can't afford to put out the whole album, because uh, what they wanted was to see if they could, like, sell Manson's music outside, literally outside the court, right. to, to raise money towards his defense. Mm. Right. So what he did was... Um, he put together his very first um, ever produced single record, the one that's called, um, I don't even know what it's called, but it's got Look at Your Game Girl and it's got Eyes of a Dreamer mm -hmm. and, uh, on it. And Manson is not even mentioned on it because they felt that maybe people wouldn't buy it if they knew it was him. So they he was labeled as Silverhorn. Only on that okay on that uh, single and um, Aesop financed it, uh, produced it, released it, and they the girls sold it outside. And uh, it's actually the first record that that's the one. Um, and what it doesn't say on this one here, but it says on the actual record, it says um, Clubhouse Records. Okay, so that's the only trace of his involvement in in this record because he just used his Venice Beach House name. Love right. It. Oh, man. Just crazy. That's Did um, Aesop, because he was so involved with... Sorry, I completely neglected the other part of your question because I was rambling on about this. The, the reason why he met Father Yo. Right. Oh, right. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, no, not at all. Paul does that all the time. But... I literally, that's my yeah. move. Is <laughs> So what happened was, like, after all this Manson stuff, uh, he he literally uh, traveled the world for two years because he fled. He just went under the radar, traveled the Far East, uh, basically just busking, playing uh, music. He did a lot of extraordinary things. He played at the Osaka World's Fair in Japan. He uh, was on a lot of TV shows around, uh, you know, in the Far East. He found Buddhism. It was all these things. And so that's a whole chapter of his life in itself. But then when he got back, he uh, he was playing guitar in front of the uh, L.A. County Museum of Art. Um, and he had this guy who's a mime uh, with him, and they had this act. And one day, suddenly, uh, all these beautiful women in white robes come walking up to him and put a crisp $100 bill in his hat. And 100 bucks was a lot of money in uh, 1973, you know? Yeah. So, uh, and then they were accompanied by Father Yod, and he invited, so he exchanged some words with Aesop, invited him to a screening of a movie at his house, um, and, um, and and so, so basically suddenly he got, he, he was, he was infatuated with uh, Father Yod, he, he already had I mean, you would be infatuated just by the fact that he, he, if you came from Manson and you were like these scraggly people out on this ranch, suddenly you have Father Yoda. They're driving Rolls Royces. Uh, they're throwing money around. They're all models. Like they look, you know, beautiful, the, the men and women. 
And so Aesop was just like, holy crap, you know? Um, so I think he was drawn to a lot of different aspects of it, uh, but most of all, the so the, the message with, with these people, the Brotherhood of the Source, was totally different than with Manson and the Bai. Everything was peace and love. He ran one of the most successful restaurants in Hollywood, the Source family uh, vegan restaurant. It was like the first of its kind. Movie stars came there. Um, it was just a, it was a totally different thing. Um, and the fact that he was also a Marine and, and their whole message was just be kind and, and stuff. Like, of course, like Jim Baker is like a kind of, like any of these guys, sort of charismatic, but kind of crazy character because the, before he transformed himself into Father Yoke, he came to Hollywood to audition for the part of Tarzan. Which he didn't get, um, and then he became this like a uh, just business tycoon, sort of um, opening up different clubs. And but in this time, also, you know, he he actually killed two people with his bare hands, um, both Jesus. in the exact same way. He uh, with a punch to the throat. He got off both times um, on self defense, and uh, so but so he was. He was like a badass, you know. Right. Um, but um, so yeah, he just transformed himself into this guru, and uh, Aesop ended up leaving because I remember he told me once he was like he said after the Marines, I just decided that I would never join another gang again. Um, That's interesting. Which is not funny yeah. because then he ended up in with the Manson group, and then he ended up with the. Uh, with the Source family, um, yeah. he sort of skirted these fringe movements. You know, he he wasn't a joiner. He was very much a free thinker, uh, and he was a peace loving guy. And he he could he was also a badass. He saw back in his time, you right? Know, he um, he just uh, I think he. Um, I think he just got a, he really, but he was kind of naive to, to a fault. Um, he, he gave people too much credit or the benefit of the doubt. And, um, right. Until he was in over his head. Yeah. Right. And, but his background, like, it's like jumping way back. He came from, from a pretty well-to-do family, right? Or at least. He like, did. So, so he, he also, I think said, if they found out, you right. know, be in trouble. But, uh, I was just different than them. He did. He came from a really, really wealthy family. Grew up in Beverly Hills in a gated community. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he his family had a family cabana at the Beverly Hills Hotel uh, for decades. There's only seven cabanas. Uh, very, very expensive. They had one for decades. You know, he would. Mm -hmm. Stay around the pool, learn how to swim in the Beverly Hills Hotel pool by the instructor. You know, go on lavish vacations. Um, he, it was, but it was a very troubled childhood because he he didn't get along with his with his dad, or he had a conflicted relationship with his brother. There was a lot of things <clears throat> that money doesn't always solve everything. Right. No, it's it's thought. interesting. The people that he would be around, which which was yeah. what kind of. Um, but let's check this out. And, yeah, sure. So he left. He left. We found this uh, in all his stuff. It's um, it's his autograph book from when oh, he oh. was at the Beverly Hills Hotel as a kid, and he would oh, just man. go. He would go from you know, celebrity. Here's Lauren Bacall, <gasps> uh, Joshua Logan. Uh, there are so many famous people in here, and they're all kind of crazy. Here's Rocky. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and he actually left a whole list of who's in here. Yeah, it's crazy. It's just, uh, yeah, all these. But it, they oh, were wow. all used today, you know, just Joe DiMaggio, Rocky Marciano, uh, Barry Sullivan, Hedy Lamar, Johnny Weissmuller, Buster Crabb. 
you know, the list goes on and on. So that's how he grew up, you know. It was just right. a whole different world from these kids. Right. And that's where I think that you would, you said that he, he gave people the benefit of the doubt. I think when yeah. you're, when you're not from the same sort of background as some of these more hard up kids, yeah, you'll, because you're not looking for a way to get one over on somebody. You're being like straight yeah. up and down where a lot of times in the, in the criminal sort of outlaw thing, like whether yeah. you like somebody or not, you're still always looking for that angle. Yeah. And that's the, and so that's where it, it feels naive, but it's more just like, it's just, you're not looking for those angles. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And, and it, it's something that's actually baffled me a little bit now that we've spent a great deal of time looking into some of these people, that a lot of these girls, for instance, on the spawn range, they didn't come from like, you know, super like bad, bad, bad families. They actually came from sort of like i don't know what you call that even uh, but they came from pretty good pretty good backgrounds or homes a lot of them had like you know parents in politics and stuff like that so it's kind of like wow but i think it it, it, a lot of it comes out as just to rebellion yeah it's like the old umbrando what are you rebelling against because what have you got right right um, yeah and I think that was a lot of Aesop's thing too, um, you, you know. Yeah, it was that. That was the time everyone was rebelling. Yeah, that was the that was the that was the whole thing. Um, there's and it's the funny thing is too. You you look at a lot of the women that came from the sort of more normal backgrounds, mm -hmm. um, and they're kind of the ones that were on the fringes, where you have the ones like. Um, Susan Atkins, who was a criminal before she got there, yeah. um, the Krenwinkel coming from the drug addict sister and just kind of being a little bit lost, Manson mm -hmm. knowing what buttons to push with her, and uh, and then yeah, just some some of the things you, you read about some of these traumas some of these women went through. I don't know if you've did you read Lynette Fromey's book, um, Reflection. I didn't. I haven't yet. Uh, there's, feel, there's just a mountain of literature on, on this subject that oh yeah, my god, we're reading all kinds of stuff and you know, yeah. watching as much as we can, talking to people, interviewing people. But that just, one gives, yeah. sorry, yeah, that one gives a really interesting. I found that one interesting because of some of the stuff that was said and some of the stuff that was not said, and I huh. think it was really interesting how she put forward like um some of the people's some of the people's histories but the way she talks sometimes is yeah. um she's got that sort of it's like, like that battered woman syndrome sort of thing like yeah. where she talks about manson jerking her around by her brain or like kicking her off of a chair but it's like yeah. I, I i needed to learn this lesson mm. sort of thing okay and uh and so that book gives a little bit of insight into that it has a whole bunch of letters as well oh and like backgrounds um uh blue she had uh which is sandra good yes like yeah. her background oh my god there's some letters in that book that are heartbreaking her yeah. like her her mother left her when she was five at her mm -hmm. school and yeah. said it was the first day go to school wasn't the first day and then just left and so oh. the cops found this five-year-old kid crying walking around looking for her family and gets taken home and just tons of stuff like that like they were a well-to-do family they were yeah. like plugged into hollywood and stuff but there were just these really dark things that happened i think it comes out of that era like in the when everything changed in the 50s uh because it's a like a quantum leap from the 50s to the 60s so it's like two different planets almost, right right um, yeah it's funny i don't know if i enclosed that in that uh in those pictures but asap pointed out to me one day suddenly to Maya and i that uh bobby Beausoleil's book his book it actually has a picture on it of um 
Aesop and the girls, and then they just put Manson's face right on top of Aesop's face. Oh, no, that's uh, Paul Watkins' book. Oh, Paul Watkins, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. No, that's okay. Hold on a sec here. I'll, I'll put that up. Yeah, you did. That's funny. That's why you put that in there. Yeah, he, he thought that was, like, pretty hilarious in a way. That's pretty mm -hmm. funny. Yeah. <laughs> Photoshop yeah. circa 1970. <laughs> that's what it is. Oh, he sort of looks like, we'll just put his face on that body. <laughs> <laughs> There's a dude with a beard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great, man. Uh, but the, again, to go back to uh, Father Yoda, the, the funny thing was that one of the last things that happened while... Um, uh, so Isop and I were both Pisces, and uh, I'm not really into all of that stuff, but uh, he loves that stuff so he <clears throat> we would meet at uh you know the frolic on his birthday and my birthday and we um, sort of just have a drink and sort of chat and blah 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 so when he got there, we couldn't do that anymore so the last birthday he had uh we went over with you know some cake and made him a drink and like in in his, in his house because he was on his uh ventilator right so um what I had done was I, I painted this picture of Father Yo that you showed a little while ago. I just forgot. So I I gave him that painting, and since the day he got that painting on, and until he died, it was on yeah. his TV. He literally put it on his TV. Oh, really? Wow. wow. On the screen. And then uh, the next time I came over, he said, you know, Thomas, uh, I look at Father every day and I um, I have to tell you, I know you did this for me for my birthday, but he didn't have brown eyes. He had blue eyes. Do you think you could fix that? And I was like, oh, shit. Wow. Because I painted it from a black and white photo. How, how did I know? So, yeah. um, so I ended up actually next time you know, bringing paint and uh, brushes and everything. And literally redoing his eyes in Aesop's bathroom because it was the only place in his whole apartment where he had light enough for me to see what I was doing. Wow. Oh, wow. And then he put it on his TV. And now the funny story about that painting to bring that to an end is that Isis Aquarian, who is the ar archivist of the Source family, she um, put out a book and uh, a documentary film that if anybody hasn't seen that movie, they have to see it. It's fantastic. What's it uh, called? The Source Family mm -hmm. um, documentary. And um, so she, we, I've been talking to her, and she was very, very kind. She um, remembered us, you know, stuff about Aesop and Father Yod, and the, she looked up his number in the Aquarian family and everything for me. And in return, we ended up sending her some of Aesop's ashes. So she did a ceremony in Hawaii in, uh, in the beautiful beach where the so-called portal is to um, the Aquarians when they pass away. Father Yod uh, is actually, it's his 100th anniversary and they, they put him, his ashes, in the portal and she did the same thing for Asa. Uh, wow. Sent beautiful pictures and um, uh, she is having a uh, show. She's 80 uh, years old now, but she's having a show here in Los Angeles next month where oh. she's launching her new coffee table book about the source family. Oh, and wow. Now, <laughs> so we're gonna go there and we'll get to see her in person and talk to her. And, um, Nice. So she's actually um, getting the painting now, and there, it's going to be in the Source family archives. For good. Wow. So that's, that's cool. That's a cool place for it to end. I think. I think so too. That's amazing, especially with the with the uh, detail that he wanted you to put into that extra like thing with the. No, I, I thought that was pretty funny. That's how you know when you know somebody who who really knew these people because. A lot of us look at all these old black and white photos and stuff, right? Yeah, how would you know? No, his eyes weren't brown. They were black. Or they were blue. They were blue, right? <laughs> and yeah. Oh, that's cool, man. That's mm -hmm. so cool. Yeah. There's so many things 
with this guy that you could go yeah. into. And I'm really looking forward to whenever manifests out of all your research and stuff like yeah. that. It's it going to be it. amazing. But we touched base on it like very shortly before we started talking here. Yeah. There's so many, it's almost like an octopus where it just, it, there's so many roads to go down when it comes not just to Manson and and the people that surround it and the trial, but it's, but for someone like Aesop who, who literally had so many different experiences in different decades, like he was just a part of all the craziest stuff, you know, and right. his whole his whole movie and acting career. And uh, it's very funny to me somehow that uh, one of his biggest roles where or where he has the most um, lines and the most screen time is when he was in uh, that Starsky and Hutch episode where he literally played Manson. Yeah. Yeah. Like a man <laughs> character, right? With the cross. Yeah. Simon yeah. Marcus or whatever his name was in the, in the thing. Yeah. He talked about that. He was like, yeah, totally. I just went in and I just uh, did the exact opposite of Charlie because Charlie was very animated and very, um, you know, good with words and flying all over the place. Yeah. So I just went in and did the opposite. I just played it very inward. And it's like, uh, but the presence was the same. And he, right. brought, he literally just brought exactly on his personal relationship with Charlie Manson, which none of the people had any idea about. Because that he had, right? They just didn't research it or look it up or put it together. And they were like, oh my God, he's almost like Manson. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he oh, got, man. Uh, yeah. So did I have a well, an, another kind of random question to do with yeah. Hollywood stuff because he was in Hollywood and he was in that stuff. It being said that it's an open secret what happened at the Tate residence in Hollywood. Did he ever come across information that he didn't know that he talked to you about along the way? Like when he when he was going through acting, someone brings up the Manson stuff and or the 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 Tate murders or anything like that and fills in some of the blanks for him. Did he ever mention anything like that to you? There is some things and it's it's stuff that we're gonna get into in in, in our project here that is that right too much about it and he, but he um you have to remember that a lot of these things have already happened right yeah right yeah. Had, so it was like he came into the it's almost like you're you're coming to a party after like there's literally like people laying around and everyone <laughs> yeah happened. like where's what's going on so that's right when he he got into it later right Right. But what I'm more meaning is afterwards, after the fact, when all was said and done and he'd left because he was still in Hollywood for quite a while after that. Oh, yeah. And so I'm wondering if any rumblings got back to him that he ever talked to you about being like, oh, well, yeah. I think I think he was he was mainly concerned about his own safety. Uh, right. that, that's what we talked about a lot. And I kept okay. telling him, you know, like, I, I just don't know. It's up. It's, um, it seems like it's so long ago. And, uh, you know, most of them are dead or in jail. And he was like, you don't know. You don't know. Uh, That's incredible. I was yeah. just about to say, like, how, how long did he still be in, was in fear for himself? But it sounds like he had those conversations with you years ago. Yeah. Like recently. Okay, yeah. Uh, up until uh, like a couple of years ago, literally. Wow. Uh, he was That's just, really intense. You understand you're dealing with a guy who lived out of a P.O. box who had like a hundred different names. He like had storage units. Uh, he went to extreme lengths to to hide any trace to where he was actually living. That That's how, and it wasn't because he was just uh, private. It was literally because he was he was just very, very concerned. And you know, of course that led up to a lot of speculation on my and, and my part, where we're like, well, 
why is he so fucking paranoid? Like, what? Is, right. Like, was he involved in more stuff than he's telling us? Maybe. Um, right. What kind of stuff could that be? You know, who knows? Um, and the, the, we're still finding out things as we go along that that's sort of puzzling. Uh, and a lot of these things, I mean, again, we rely a little bit on uh, on Nicholas Rack to, to help put some of these things together and make it a little more clear uh, to us. And But you have to understand also with with Aesop, he left so much behind. We have only gotten literally still to the like, tip of the iceberg. Right. I mean, there is so much information. I, I've divided it into three categories. There's paper, there's analog, and there's digital. The paper section alone is like our whole porch is just full of boxes, right? Oh, wow. We've gone through and sort of analyzed what we have and what's there and and stuff like that and then the the analog section is uh all these different outdated types of media of uh cassette players dictaphones like mini cassette tapes uh reels uh right betamax like huge cassettes that you're like fuck what is this you, yeah you you, you you know, everything is so digital now that you look at some of the stuff and you have to literally go out and buy equipment from that time because they don't even make it anymore just to be able to, right. to hear right. what's happening. Yeah. And then there's the digital, which is um, just going to take a long time to go through because it's all his, you know, all his, just basically everything that has to do with uh, backup and hard drives and computers and Whatnot. And All there's that stuff. a ton of stuff on there. And it, it feels, it's like a Sherlock Holmes thing. And sometimes it feels also a little bit, uh, to be honest, a little bit um, invasive to right. <laughs> to do, you know? Right. Literally, I, I mean, I don't, it's, it's the last thing that people want is when they die to somebody to really go through your computer and your iCloud and your everything. It's just yeah. it has to be some sort of level of privacy at some point, right? But right. Like, one of the things I'm talking about is like, so suddenly there's this, you find this, right? It's like, okay, um, all right. So that's a roll of uh, film. And then a note falls out and it says a whole bunch of stuff on there. Among other things, it says Father Yod and Regis Philbin. You know, very odd. Oh, yeah. What? <laughs> Literally, and I, you know, we're just like, what? The, how? How? What? How? What's yeah. the connection on that? So that's something, and then we find this. Like I was telling you about this uh, enormous cassette. It's oh, right. It's old. Um, it's got his managers. Uh, sticker down here is management, uh, right? <laughs> and wow. a lot of old shots and some different stuff he did. Um, it's like his, it's it's his reel, right? Like it's his, yeah, it it's like a gigantic Memorex cassette. Oh, wow, it reminds me of like a portfolio book, yeah. You go bring to an audition, yeah. And it Crazy. Could, and then we have, you know, all his uh. When I told you we found his uh, appearance on the Gong Show, yes, hilarious. Um, so uh, obviously we have all the, obviously we have all his uh, his uh, appearances in all his films and movies and TV and everything. There's all the times he was with um, you know appeared with like James Garner or he was in uh, Big Wednesday with. Um, like John Milius and uh, just all these crazy parts. But the funny thing is that a lot of the parts that he played was actually himself in a in one point in his life. Mm -hmm. So he, right. he'd be the Manson kind of cult leader. He would be the hippie waiter working at the surf bar uh, in Venice, or he would be the badass biker in Galaxina with Dorothy Stratton. Of course, he was murdered, and 
Yeah, here with uh, with Garner. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of those, and, and one of the reasons why he got a lot of work in Westerns and stuff like that was because he was he was really good with horses, which was also, again, his job as Spawn Branch, mm. was to take care of the horses, to take them out, and, you know, and here he is with, uh, what's his face, Robocop. Uh, Peter right, Robert. that's who that is. That's yeah. Robocop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For those who don't know, how were you able to be able to get all this from um, from him after he passed away? Well, so what happened was that when he actually died, it, it was a terrible day because <clears throat> it happened at 4 a.m. or something. We got a call from the cops. We go over there, and there he is, dead on the floor. There's the flag. Fire. Um, I love the way they did. This is like classic video store, like magic, where it's so misplaced and, and, and misproduced. It doesn't even have the title on there and half the title <laughs> on there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Video cassettes are supposed to look, if you ask, like Tarantino. All right. Um, but so also, so the way that it came about was, Aesop really wanted us to take care of his things. Uh, we had gotten very close. Uh, he trusted us. He didn't trust anybody else. Um, he wanted to make sure that uh, nothing happened to his things. And, of course, we only found out later what was in his things because we didn't – it's not something we sat there and right. went through when he was alive. Um, so it's mind blowing to us. Um, and I wish now that I could somehow get him back to say, dude, why did you not tell us about this? Why didn't you show us this? What, how could you, uh, what about all these poems from Spawn Ranch, man? Like, what the hell? Yeah. Um, and all that stuff. Um, but so what happened was he, uh, when we got there, so he was dead on the floor and it was four in the morning and they didn't know who to call. So they, they, figured out a way to get a hold of Maya and I to go over there. And it was really crazy because even the cops, LA cops, you know, they've seen a lot. Um, you know, they were kind of baffled because they said, well, yeah, it was strange because the he could have he could have lied in this apartment for days. He could have been like laying around for days, but he'd only been here a short time. And the only reason that we got alerted, because it was behind gated uh, you know, fans and many lots on his door was that his dog, his little dog, had figured out a way to press his life alert bracelet, which alarmed the cops and notified them to come that something was wrong. Wow. So, and they were like, Yeah, I don't know, man. I've been a cop for a long time. I've never seen a dog do that. But, um, so, that was this kind of. But his little dog tried to say his save this life. All right. Oh. Like calling the cops somehow. Isn't that crazy? Uh, that is just nutty. And so basically what happened after that was he he had already told us that he would he wouldn't want all his things to fall into the wrong hands. Mm -hmm. Right. And he wanted he wanted us to make sure that it didn't get thrown out. Or, yeah, there he is with uh, Lady Farrah T Dog. Uh, Typical so Aesop, because his name was Aesop T Aquarian. So, of course, his yeah. dog's name is Lady, Lady Farrah T Dog. Yeah, oh. of course. <laughs> That's cute, and man. That's awesome. The T, the T stands for the in all the Aquarians. Uh, <laughs> that was funny because we didn't know that. My wife at one point says, well, so what does the T stand for? Is that some Aquarian thing? And he was like, the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so great. Man. Well, you guys have just had the most interesting time, I'm sure, getting yeah. to know this guy and just eye-opening and learning so much about the times yeah. throughout his life. And but, but one thing, like 
just when at the same with uh, that he wanted us to take possession of all his stuff was also an extension of he wanted us to tell his story mm -hmm. finally right, right? Mm -hmm. and that was something that didn't really come around until the very end where he admitted it. and he said that was very important to him because um, it's funny because you you spend half like or I don't know nine tenths of your life trying to hide everything about your life and then in the last tenth suddenly you want to found two people in a bar that you trust enough that you say okay I want you to tell my story and I want you to tell it the, the correct way one of his biggest hang-ups in his whole life with, was with uh, Robert Hendricks because he felt like Hendricks and Royally fucked him over. Right. He never got any credit for everything he did. He never got any money uh, from it. He ended up giving up his house. It cost him like a lot. And Hendrickson made a, his whole life about that after that. Right? Right. With both different movies and his book and all this stuff. And, and he saw, and they were friends. You know, they were, and he gave up his Jesus movie to give. Hendrix and this opportunity that ended up messing up Aesop's whole life in many ways. Um, yeah. So he had um, he had no love for uh, for Robert Hendrix, uh, and also, uh, by the way, um, Merrick, his acting teacher, apparently was a like a tyrant. He was. The way he ran his school was like he was almost like a sadist sort of teacher who enjoyed, you know, seeing his students really torn apart and just vulnerable. And everybody hated him. And Aesop said, mm -hmm. like, a, even before the Manson stuff, one of his friends, who was also a student, wanted to kill him. Oh, fuck. Mm -hmm. And so when I said, well, do you think it was? One of the Manson people, or he was like, "Yeah, it could have been, could have easily have been one of them, but it could have been anybody because he was a dick." His voice. <laughs> 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 anybody. <laughs> yeah. So, so it is funny that that for Aesop in particular, those two guys um, ended up becoming very, very sort of instrumental to how his whole life. Uh, panned out yeah and it was just it was literally in 19 late 1969 to middle of 1970 it wasn't very long it's like five months you know six months yeah. just the same with uh with clubhouse when he was living with uh who stayed this and bill Vance and the girls it was um maybe a month right you know? People forget just, because it becomes this like big thing, and uh, it, when I would or Maya, you know, would ask myself, "Man, what was it like? What would you guys do every day?" And it's like, "What were you doing?" He, it, I mean, it was a very short time. So yeah, it, it wasn't like something where they had like years, you know. To right. you know, yeah, we did this on Thursday and that on, you know, blah blah blah. Yeah. It was just very, very uh, sort of concentrated energy for a very short period of time. Right. And it's wild, too, because any of us who try and look back at like five months of our yeah. lives when we were however old he was. Yeah. And you go along and somebody's like, tell me everything from those five months. You're like, fuck off. I, can't, I don't even know where. Like, I wouldn't even know how to chronologically go through my life for the most part other than the really big things and it's yeah. interesting we all look we're all looking so much at these people's lives and it was just like for some it was a few years of their lives and yeah for some it was five months right? small like, fraction small yeah. nothing but they're all but it's so under the microscope and people want all these answers and it's expecting these elderly people to remember 
their short visits to spawn ranch that that didn't have the monumental like um <clears throat> energy about it that it does now like people looking back at it we're like well what did the ground look like or whatever <laughs> stuff like that they're like i don't know i went to buy weed like <laughs> yeah something to that yeah. effect yeah yeah and that's again like you forget like how much of it was just really about money and drugs you know right mm -hmm. um, some informants all that sort of stuff going over the the ranch and it's funny how you had said and i i hope we'd said because we said a little bit before we started if we didn't say it i think it's important that you said that he had thought that manson was um was just kind of getting getting bum rushed by the cops because they yeah. were looking they looked like a hippie commune mm -hmm. just like a regular commune he was like well why why are you guys up their ass about all this stuff? And then later on, you see these documents that are like they had machine guns. And like all yeah, this right, not not your usual hippies. Uh, yeah, but uh, no, and that, that was a big part of Aesop's personality. Uh, even in his, you know, later years, he really didn't like any kind of authority or cops, especially uh, dating back to the, because the whole thing with the long hair and beard and stuff, which was a big part of his personality. Also, in later life, he got a lot of his acting work. You know, he acted in, like, all of, until the end, he was, like, in Kanye West music videos, and he was, like, in all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, he played an Amish person, you know, he played, uh, he played, uh, you know, Hasidic Jews, and he played all these roles, because he had this, like, long, long beard and stuff like that. And, and he was just, uh, yeah, that was a big part of it. He felt he had been harassed by cops, and that's why he was like, for sure, you know, hey, maybe he didn't do it, maybe he didn't do it because I'm just gonna wait till the trial is over because they accuse me of shit all the time. So that I right, right. They created, um, at some point, he had a really nice motorcycle, and the cops stopped him for no reason. And took his motorcycle, never, never gave it back. Oh, that's oh my God! Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you don't think through, about that. You had to go through so much, like court cases and all kinds of stuff, to get that bike back. And even when the judge finally said, "Right, okay, it was wrongful," uh, blah blah blah, he st he, they still didn't give it back to him. Jesus. So he did have um, a healthy amount of like disdain for. The authority, yeah, man. There's also, a funny clip in uh, in um, uh, Big Wednesday at the end of huh? Van Nuys. Oh, Van Nuys Boulevard, yeah. Uh, Van Nuys Boulevard, another classic. He was in uh, towards the end. There's the scene where he handcuffs a cop to his car, and uh, he takes his gun and his shit, and the cop goes like. Why? Why are you doing this? I'm gonna remember you. Not get you. Why are you doing this? And then he just leans over and goes, "Because you're the man, man." Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. So, and sweet. he's wearing all his jewelry. Actually, that um, in all his movies, it's really funny. Everything that he wore for his part was his. Like he would bring right. that to it. You know. Wow. So it's really funny. Uh, he he uh, yeah he he really didn't like authority and all that stuff. Right, this is a fascinating character, man. Yeah, he was. Yeah, and, um, I wish you could have gotten to talk to him because you you know the interesting thing about him was that you really had to know your your stuff to get him to talk. Because he was very sort of a little bit like Manson in that way. That well, Manson lied, but not he wasn't a compulsive liar. Um, he would either talk around or evade sort of the, the thing. Right. It was very much a matter of you had to know the question to get an answer. He would never bring something up himself. Right. Relating to right. any uh, the part of that built in. Um, anti-authoritarian sort of thing, where like yeah, people also can... a lot of his fears about you know whatever retribution or whatever mm. for and part in this whole mess was that he um, 
He just never talked about it. Um, right. It was a really big surprise because after the reporter article came out and we got him to talk about it a little bit with the reporter, there were people um, that he had known for 30, 40 years who were just blown away, shocked that, like, they didn't know anything about this. Nothing. Ever. Wow. Wow. Uh, right. And they had seen yeah. him, you know, on a regular basis, like, uh, for 40 years. <laughs> and you'd, and I mean, you know this guy, you'd gotten very close with him in six years. There's a lot of people who would say that they're, you know, they had their brushes with the Manson folks and yeah. they were yeah. scared of this and that. Now, when this guy was telling you he was freaked out of the Manson commune, you knew him. Like you, you weren't reading any exaggeration in this. This was like he was, he was legitimately scared, and yeah, he and all the stuff he said, like when he told you about them to asking him to go and kill the judge and uh, and Vincent Bugliosi, mm -hmm. like that spooked him enough that he was like, "I'm fucking out of here." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it says a lot that he actually uh, he went. Literally left the country immediately after for two years. Didn't come back. Two years. Wow. And we haven't found a notebook where he uh, had a suicide note. He tried to kill himself. Really? Mm -hmm. Abroad. Wow. wow. Did um, it mention the? Did it mention anything about the Spawn Ranch or anything like that? No, but he actually uh, we asked him about it uh, previously because he did say at some point that he had tried to kill himself. You know? Oh my God, why? And he was just like, well, I felt like I accomplished everything I wanted and blah, blah, blah. But I, you know, so I assumed that that was something that was, was way, way later. Uh, but he actually attempted that in one way or another in, in, um, in whatever country he was in at that time in the Far East. And then he ended up in, uh, was it in Iran? Afghanistan. He was in Afghanistan and he ended up, woke up like strapped to a bed in a prison cell because he had gotten a scuffle with uh, with some cops. And wow. Like he said, my Marine training must have kicked in because I don't remember what happened or whatever. But they had literally cuffed him to the bed. And when he finally got out of that mess, he... Um, that's when he returned to the States. I think he had reached sort of a conclusion that, okay, I'm ready to come home. Yeah. I have cleansed yeah. myself of every kind of uh, demon or whatever I have. So now, now I'm coming back. Right. And the dust will have maybe settled a yeah, little I bit from. He runs into uh, the source family right after. Yeah. Oh, God. That's incredible. It's it's funny that too that he ended up <clears throat> like being a part of that and the Manson thing and having those two very charismatic leaders on kind of like the lighter and the darker side of the coin and him yeah. being so drawn to that. Like he always seemed to be he seemed to be like a bit of a searcher, a bit of a looking for his path. Yeah. And a lot of the literature that he would read and a lot of the books that we found and some of which we also sent to Nicholas because it's a part of his practices and stuff. It's, it's just uh, his, it was just his whole um, outlook was very, uh, it's a, it's very yin yang kind of when you think about it because he, he's this hippie, he's this like, you know, hey man, like big Lebowski almost kind of dude, but then he ends up in all this like insane stuff. Right. right? Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, but so a lot of the things that we have spent our time on also is, yeah, he was our friend. We loved him and, uh, you know, but at the same time, there, there's always new things popping up where it's like, oh, okay. So does that mean he knew about this or before? Right. Um, and and uh, so it's the afterlife sort of now where it's more like an, a, a piece of detective work that we're doing. Um, yeah. 
because it was funny in the very beginning when we sort of cracked who he was for the first time yeah. and we confronted him about it. He was really freaked out that we knew now who he was, right? Yeah. Right. At the same time, certainly my wife was kind of suddenly freaked out that we were like hanging out with this Manson dude. And he's like, what? Well, how the hell did that happen? <laughs> So what exactly, you know, I mean, are you sure he's saying, you know, telling the truth about these things? Or, like, why don't we know where he lives? Why don't we know anything, uh, you know, like, why won't he, uh, why do we always have to meet him in a public place? Like, there's all these things. Like, so it, it was just weird. Uh, in, <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> for the first year or so, it was definitely a little strange. But yeah, absolutely. And it's and now as you say, you're just unwrapping all of it and figuring out why things were strange or yeah. certain things had happened. It's like, oh well, that makes a little bit more sense now, doesn't it? Um we're so we've come up on two hours. I have a feeling this is not gonna be the last time we talk to you about this. Because <laughs> man, yeah, there's so not. much to talk about. But I um, really enjoyed it and um I'm very happy that it finally uh, that it finally happened. I mean, we, it came in like a couple of, but in true Aesop fashion, we, we like the world of the universe suddenly collapsed on yeah. us. We had to reschedule many times and like blah blah blah. So yeah. Oh man, it was just like okay, yeah, huge just culmination of stuff, and we've been trying to do this for a while, and I'm so happy that yeah. we got to. This has been wonderful. And if people heard a dog bark earlier on, that's the dog. That's the uh, the hero dog. Ace up. Little, Ace up. Yeah. Lady Ferrety dog. She's, yeah. oh, she's watching oh. over me over here. Come here, puppies. Let's see if she'll say hi. Hi, puppies. Hey, come here. Oh, Hello. we are all about this. I'm most excited for this. <laughs> yeah, this is the best. Well, we're at the climax of the interview. Oh, oh there you are. Love. Baby. <laughs> yeah. She's so oh. cute. Oh, what a sweet dog. That was a cameo. Yeah. <laughs> a little cameo. Oh, my God. I'm a little starstruck. It's going to take me a minute. To Don't hold the show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I, I would love to come back uh, at some point because I – like I said, we keep finding things, and like I just now look over, and I'm like, "Oh, what the hell is this? Uh, oh, okay, uh, it is a check from Mark Ross, Twenty Eight Clubhouse, for twenty seven dollars for parking tickets." Which is <laughs> 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 so random. That's so awesome. But you know what? A good way to end it would probably be because I've been talking about his poems, and there was one little poem that I would like to read. Absolutely. Yes, yes. please. From 1970, um, from Spawn Ranch. And it's called, Hey Baby. I got to get some light. Okay. Hey baby, why don't you look my way? Hey baby, why don't you look my way? Because I, I got a couple of things I got to say. Yes, I got a couple of things I got to say. Hey, baby, don't go telling about your past. Hey, baby, don't go telling me about your past. Because it's always here and now. And the earth spins fast. Yes, it's always here and now. And the earth spins fast. Hey, baby, I don't even have to know your name. Hey, baby, I don't even have to know your name. If it's Claudia, Kathy, Patty, Sue, well, it's all the same. If it's Claudia, Kathy, Patty, Sue, well, it's all the same. Hey, baby, uh, how how all the now all the words have been said? Hey, baby, now all the words have been said. Now let's go for a swim inside your head. Let me go for a swim inside your head. Wow. Recognize the names at the end of that. Yeah. Right? 
Wow. Yeah. Well, that was pretty crazy. Totally. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And wow. thank you for everything. There's so many more that uh, I hope very soon that uh, with Nicholas's help, we can shed some light on because um, there, there, there are some really mysterious ones and some really crazy ones and just some that are puzzling. Yeah. Oh, we can't wait. Well, thank you for uh, spending some time with us. Thank and you. Yeah, we will we will be back doing this very soon. And I'm Thanks, very everyone. happy that everyone is healthy and still around. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it was a close one. Oh, man. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye.